Hey guys, this is Hardy, and today I thought we would do another figure painting. I enjoyed the last one so much, I, I think I'm going to try and do one of these every once in a while. So we'll sort of mix these in with my other concept art stuff from time to time, because these are just such a nice, relaxing break from heavy design work. It's this very calm, relaxing activity. I don't know, it feels like I'm knitting or whittling or something. It's just this very natural thing that just lets your brain sort of switch off. And that reminded me of something I heard once, that every artist has this thing, or maybe a few things, that when you just turn your brain off and let your hand take over, let the stylus kind of do what it wants, there is always some subject that your hand naturally finds its way to. I remember the concept artist Fang Zhu saying that this was insects for him. He would kind of just find himself sketching little bugs or insectoid monsters or something. And I think that this might be it for me because when I need a break from work, from concept art, from designing, I find myself just sketching figures, like going back to a figure painting class, trying to find some really authentic relaxed pose with some very human moment. So I think I'm going to tap into that and do one of these every once in a while, make this a regular thing. And it's just something that I have thought about and struggled with really so much that I think I'm going to have enough to say about the subject of painting people to fill a hundred videos. So hope you're enjoying these. I definitely am. So as I start sculpting out the values on this figure, let's talk about her pose. And really it's what I had settled before the video even began, because that's where a lot of the work and a lot of the noodling, a lot of the erasing and starting over, kind of the ugly parts of the process happen. And I should have the courage to just show the entire process from a blank canvas, and I will make an effort to do so for my next one. But for this one, I thought we would just start there and kind of jump right into value, which is when kind of the cool payoff moments start happening. To find the right pose, there's a lot that goes into that. We talked a lot about anatomy last time. Obviously that is huge. We simply need to have the right stuff be the right size in the right place. You know, the ear has to be the right distance from the shoulder. The elbow has to be the right distance from the wrist. All of these things just need to add up. Otherwise, your viewer will pick that out immediately as something that just feels wrong. But pose is incredibly important too. And it's one of those really awesome subconscious things that we can play with when painting people to communicate volumes. So right now, I am going once again for this pose that just shows kind of a candid moment. She's just relaxed in a moment of repose, I think is the art school term for this kind of just relaxed, lost in thought, kind of very authentic, calm moment. And that's what I'm trying to capture here. It's weirdly sort of a, a blank pose. It's somebody doing nothing, just sitting there thinking. And that's very deliberate. That's why you see so many figure paintings or portraits done like this. Somebody in this incredibly neutral moment of relaxation. You don't see a lot of 12 foot oil portraits of somebody like jumping in the air, doing a roundhouse kick or somebody screaming at the top of their lungs. It's usually something like this, these kind of classic artist poses where weight is distributed very evenly where the subject looks really relaxed. She's just lost in thought. And I think the reason that that works so well is because it's sort of a blank slate. It's one of those awesome things we can do with artfulness where we, we leave things unanswered a little bit. We suggest things, but we want the viewer to take that last step. We don't want to give them the entire story. We want to kind of suggest, lead them to a conclusion, but have them have to sort of figure it out, project themselves into your work. I try to do that 
with all of my work, with concept art, with design, with rendering, I always try to leave that bit unanswered. And that always makes it more of an active process with the viewer, inviting the viewer in. One of the biggest lessons that, that we study uh, when I'm working with, with students, with mentorships, is that principle. It's a, it seems like a very straightforward thing, but it, it's oddly nuanced where to kind of show less and where do we actually need to describe things really carefully. But it's interesting. And when, when coming up with the right pose, it can be really easy to kind of go astray with that. So I wanted her to look very authentically relaxed. I want it to seem like all of the weight of her upper body is on her elbow and therefore her head which is resting on her hand is also transferring that weight to her elbow a lot of that comes from how her her waist her spine is kind of curved it's like there's a slouch her shoulders are very neutral her collarbones are kind of relaxed if i made her too upright if she had her elbow on this theoretical armrest but her midsection was very straight. It would look like she's actually supporting her weight with her own abdominal muscles, right? And that would make it look very fake. Weirdly, it would look like she is posing. And just the act of it looking like a pose, something that was contrived or created just for the, the virtual camera we are imagining our viewpoint from that sort of starts to make it ring false. So these little things like how weight is carried, how the body's communicating emotion or a state of relaxation, how authentically relaxed and kind of caught in a candid moment of repose, the, the more authentic you can make that with weight distribution, I think the better the effect is. And I really like how this works, especially the, the area where her neck and shoulders and collarbones, that's sort of my favorite part of this rendering, at least up to this point. It looks really authentically relaxed. All of those muscles of the neck, the collarbones, the shoulders, all of the way that, that the skin is kind of creasing and all those value edges are showing different forms kind of overlapping it just feels very authentic it looks relaxed she looks like she is truly leaning against this armrest so that she can think about x whatever your viewer wants to imagine is on her mind and that brings us back to the face i've actually managed to get pretty far in this without talking about how important her facial expression is. As we've talked about, the face is by far the most important part of any character painting, any figure painting, any portrait. The face just is the thing that your viewer engages with immediately, every time. It's what we just instinctively want to look at. I think it's probably some evolutionary thing where we are trained to kind of know what the other person is thinking when we interact with them. We want to size them up, wonder how they feel about us. Are they, are they mad at us? Do they like us? We get all of that from facial cues. So that's why faces are so important. So as I carve out all of these forms, as I refine things, kind of brighten little skin tone highlights or deepen shadows or add cast shadows, all of that is describing forms of the face. How far out do her cheekbones protrude? The corners of her mouth communicate volumes. If her lips are pursed in a certain way, it communicates something. But if the corners of her mouth are drawn back, it can look like she is grinning a little bit. So oddly, finding that truly neutral, relaxed facial expression can be kind of elusive and you can accidentally stray from what you intended to something you didn't intend very easily so relaxed can very easily turn into like disdain or disgust 
with just some slight form modifications of the corners of the mouth. It's crazy. Like so many things with painting people, the nuance, the tiniest little changes we can make totally changes how everything is perceived. And that's really one of the challenges, but also the, the fun of this, the thrill of making it work is when you can balance all of those things. So a lot to calculate as always, but fun and worthwhile. And, and certainly a skill set that a concept artist, an illustrator, all kinds of art careers really can make good use of very strong people painting skills. It's, it's something that when you see it in an artist's portfolio, it just immediately shows sophistication that this artist is a student and an observer of the world around them which is really kind of the core of design and concept art, right? Is how well we can collect the world around us and kind of reconstruct it into something that will be valuable for a project. How can we create cool things that will make our employer's project cooler? And I think maybe no single skill does that as effectively, demonstrates that as effectively is showing that you really know how to paint people well. And I, I think a lot of that is just because it is such a technical challenge. There are so many different things to calculate and balance that when an artist can do it, it's it's kind of impressive. Or at least I certainly find it impressive when, uh, when checking out portfolios. It, man, this artist really knows their stuff. This person has studied uh, and really observed and appreciated the people they they interact with um, it's cool it's it's like being a, a student of your fellow human and and really observing them that's another great concept art skill just how how well do you collect things around you airport is a great example for me when I am bored waiting for a delayed flight or something I start just collecting the characters that walk by I mean we all love people watching but I try to do it pretty deliberately. Um, try to do some, a, a cool old man with a gnarly beard. Wow, that guy would make a great like Viking mystic or something. Things like that, filing away facial expressions or a hairstyle you've never seen before or some kind of tattoo that you've never seen. All of these little details become another asset for your concept art visual library, the things that you can summon and weave into your own original ideas. One of the concept artist's most valuable assets, just how well can you call up the coolness that you have collected in your life. It's also one of those awesome things that makes every artist unique. When, when we are in a competitive field, like basically any creative career, it's important to try to stand out. And having a unique spin, a unique thing about your work is one of the best ways you can do that. No one in the world has had your exact experiences. So that uniqueness, the, the journey you have been on, the cool stuff you have consumed and filed away, it all makes you more valuable, more unique, and more indispensable. So. Wow, I just made the airport sound fun and important somehow. Um, but a cool thing to keep in mind, and it can actually make boredom something that you're sometimes grateful for, weirdly. Um, cool, so we're, we're finally getting into some hair, which is always a fun part of the process. And this is always a great time for me to point out minimalism and how sometimes less is more can be such an effective strategy with art, with design, with renderings. And hair, I think, is the greatest example of that. For some reason, if we just turn hair into shapes, if we reduce it to the simplest possible expression, it looks better, I think, in a painting. If we try and render every individual hair, which I did for years, thinking that 
Well, if I can see every individual hair in this person I'm looking at, well, then of course I should do that in my own work. But that never looked good. The, the individual hairs just turned into this distracting, noisy garbage that I never was satisfied with. No amount of rendering could make that seem okay. So it, it works with leaves in a forest. It works with eyelashes. If we can just reduce these things to shapes, kind of encode them for our viewer to sort of understand themselves, it just reads better. It's, it's kind of impressionism. I thought I'd go for a different hair color this time too. Instead of another dark haired subject, I thought we'd give her some really fiery kind of auburn hair, some, some red hair, which I think is so cool. And when we get to that greatest payoff moment of, of all of these, which will be the edge lights that I add later, it really pops because it kind of glows. The hair transmits light. It looks really dramatic and, and beautiful. So I think this will be a fun choice. Let's talk about skin a little bit. Obviously another very important part of painting people. And skin is an oddly complicated material to render. If you are rendering wood or stone or water, there is a formula that you can follow. I've, I've put together this awesome library of exercises on how to paint pretty much anything. Skin, I think, is the most difficult exercise because there are just so many dynamics at play. Skin has a local color and obviously that varies depending on the person. There are people with very light skin tones, there are people with very dark skin tones. So that's one variable. Skin also reflects light in certain ways, but it also transmits light. Lights can go beneath the surface of the skin and kind of bounce around and make skin glow. You may have heard of the term subsurface scattering, where light goes beneath the skin and it can make your your hand for example if you put a flashlight on it it will glow bright red like your et or something subsurface scattering but more subtly skin transmits light in different ways what that means practically for an artist trying to draw believable looking skin is a lot simpler really we just need to have hue variation we need the skin not to just be one single hue of kind of grayish brown, you know, tan or whatever color in the crayon box you want to call this sort of flesh color. It needs to have some variation. And that's really important to making skin look lifelike regardless of the person's local color of their skin. We need to have areas where it's more red where they have some kind of blush of their cheeks, the, the redness of the tip of their nose or their lips. And relative to the surrounding skin, which is a little bit less red, it actually picks up some more of those greens and cyans that I started from. Actually, that's very deliberately why I start with a dark cyan base, is so that it can have that core, that kind of base, to where if I don't add red, some of that cyan will show through, and it gives us this really amazing, lifelike skin tone. It's that hue variation. It's, it's having certain parts be a little more red relative to the others. You can get more in-depth on that. There are actually some parts of the face that get a little more yellow, some that even have some, some bluish zones actually right in the corner of the eye, the eyelids, they can really pick up some blues weirdly. And then of course there's always more ways we can add dynamics to this. There can be a colorful light source somewhere in the room. She could be sitting by a fireplace or she could be sitting by a window where there's some blue skylight kind of bouncing off of her face. So it's really cool. All of these decisions are left to us. And it, it ends up being a really subtle thing. So if, for example, if I put a really intense bluish light, like an edge light on the, the far side of her face, it could look like she's sitting by that 
blue sky window. But if I have a really intense orangish light, maybe coming from somewhere below, it will look like that fireplace. And obviously those two different ways you could go, it tells a totally different story. It gives the entire image a different mood. So the lights that we choose, these little director decisions that we make, they end up really shaping things in the final effect. So even after we have navigated all the complexity of rendering a believable person who is communicating the personality that we want, the story, the, the blank slate that we let people project the story that they imagine into, even after we've done all that, we can still radically change things just with these details that we start to add near the end. And I know that sounds daunting, but that's actually what I find so cool about this. So powerful is that the, the devil is in the details, all of the subtlety, all of these little uh, bits of minutia that we can change end up having this really dramatic effect on just that, that first 10 seconds, maybe not even 10, first second and a half when your viewer just sees your image when it's just hitting their eyeballs and they are decoding everything subconsciously, basically instantly. All of the total of the decisions that you've made leading up to that, that's how it's going to be received. And maybe nothing so powerfully as people paintings, as, as showing the human form in some way, can people just instantly make a decision about it. With all kinds of concept art, we are usually trying to evoke other things, right? So think of a, a robot that looks like a spider or something. We're trying to make somebody think of a spider. We're trying to make them imagine how a spider walks around. There is power in that because when it's immediately identified as spider-like, then our viewer can assume all these things about how it walks, it might jump, how does it you know, stab with its front legs? Uh, something like that, maybe it traps something in a robot version of a web. You get it. With people, there's no translation. They don't have to kind of go searching through their, their mental file on spiders to think, oh, okay, I get it, so it's like a spider, it probably walks like this. There's just no connection that needs to be made. People just get people without any translation. It's just it's just all there immediately. The payoff moment, that, that moment that we want our viewer to remember. It just happens. It kind of all takes shape. And I think that's cool. That's that's kind of the like instant payoff reveal moment uh, at its most powerful. And that's kind of what we're always working towards with, with a painting like this. Um, one thing I get asked pretty regularly after these videos is, is how long does this take? How much is this sped up? And rest assured, this is not real time. I, I pre-recorded it and I'm doing the voiceover afterwards, kind of watching it happen. So I am in no way this fast. Uh, I believe the total time on this, including coming up with the pose, was around three hours. So just kind of uh, responding to a frequently asked question there. Uh, about three hours all in. But I uh, wanted to make this not quite so agonizingly long and just something fun to kind of watch unfold in a half hour or so. So we we can just talk about the, the main points and, and just watch something cool take shape. So she's coming along pretty well here. The drapery of the dress always adds a lot of nice contrast. I think that's Showing a different material really makes the skin kind of stand up. But of course, my favorite part of, of every figure painting, maybe of every rendering I do, is the edge lights. And just check out how these little marks in this off-white color, it just brings everything to life. It, it finishes the three-dimensional form of her face really beautifully. It adds instant drama. I always think it's sort of like in a photography studio when they put that, that third light off in the distance to kind of 
make the silhouette of the subject stand out. It kind of just draws this line around their silhouette and makes them pop out. I love that. So the word that always comes to mind for this is cinematic. It's just instant drama. And as I add these highlights to the hair, this is one of the only places where I actually break my own rule about showing individual hairs. Weirdly, when edge lights hit hair, I think it, it works if we actually show the edge lights picking up a few little individual strands of hair. Because that is that is how it, it tends to work in real life. You can actually see lots and lots of detail when those edge lights kind of illuminate somebody on the side of their face or from the back of their head. The hair just seems to kind of catch on fire in this really cool way. And we can see lots of detail. So one of those those areas where we can artfully and with restraint apply detail while trying not to overdo it and over describe remember we always want to kind of suggest more than we overtly just show it's time to sort of add these final little bits of interest after all the whole point of this video was to talk about telling a story with a character Weirdly, the, the lesson that I think I've come away with here is kind of the opposite. How if we imply a story, how if we show our viewer just enough to get their own brain working, the actual story that they take away from it becomes more meaningful and more authentic in their own mind. It's sort of like they get to project themselves into your work and they make the story for you which is awesome. When you can get your viewer to buy in in that way, it's, it's almost like they are doing a lot of the work for you. So just adding a few little style touches. I've added a tattoo to her leg. I think I'm gonna lose that, but little bits of jewelry, all of these little minor touches really communicate personality. Uh, a, lot, a lot like the clothing she chooses. It shows what is she dressed for? Uh, these nice dresses I've, I've shown these, these women in the last two paintings, I like how it implies that she is either going to or coming home from a formal event. It's just kind of an interesting story. What's, what's going on tonight? Is she going to a wedding or something formal? A cool little bit of story to suggest without showing too much. And I, I think that's just about the right balance to strike. We let the jewelry, the clothing, maybe the tattoo, but not this time, do a lot of that, that storytelling for us. So with just a little bit of gold metallic treatment, it, it's amazing how little rendering you have to do to make this jewelry look like jewelry. Kind of just make it shiny in a few places. But other than that, just the, the silhouette shapes kind of do it. And another one of those places where I think the less we can describe it, the better it ends up looking. But guys, with that, I think we have a finished painting. I love how this one came out. These are really fun and relaxing, and I'm, I'm just enjoying spending a half hour talking about this subject that I find so endlessly fascinating. So I hope you enjoyed this one. I will definitely try and do more of these in the future. So definitely check back in the weeks ahead. In the meantime, Good luck with your artwork. Paint something cool today.